Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? These are timely and eye-opening messages to help us prepare for the soon second coming of Jesus. Join us today to understand what the Bible says about the evil leader who will emerge and reign supreme on earth after the rapture. Learn what to expect during the rise of the Antichrist. driving from Florida to Houston to visit family, and uh, they were just, just going, just the two of them, and they were a little older, and, and she had a problem in that she was kind of hard of hearing, but she wanted to know everything that was going on, so she had to ask questions a lot because she didn't catch uh, all the you know, talk back and forth. Well, they, they set out and they get about halfway there and they have to stop to get gas. And they pulled into this nice station. It was a full service station. You guys remember when we had that? Uh, we don't have that anymore, but it was full service. And so the attendant comes out and he goes to the, the driver's side to the, to the man driving the car, the husband there. And he said, uh, he said, what'll it be? And he said, fill her up. And he said, what do you want me to give you? He said, Premium or, uh, or unleaded? And uh, regular or premium? And the man said premium. And the wife was sitting there and she knew they were talking and she said to her husband, what did he say? And the husband said, well, he just asked me what kind of gas I wanted and I told him I wanted premium. And so then the attendant is looking at this guy's car. He said, what a nice car. He said, uh, what kind of car is this? He said, it's a Chrysler. And the wife said, what did he say? And he said, well, he asked me what kind of car I drove, and I told him a Chrysler. She goes, oh, okay. And the man said to him, he said, well, where are you headed anyway? He said, well, we're headed to Houston. And the woman said, what did he say? She said, he asked me where we were going. I told him Houston. And then the attendant thought for a moment. He said, Houston, huh? He said, I once knew a woman in Houston. She was the meanest, most vile, vicious, horrible person I do believe she was related to the devil. And the wife said, what did he say? And the man said, he thinks he knows your sister. <laughs> We're in a series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? And today, we want to talk not about the devil's sister, but about the devil's man. The one who is coming that the Bible said was going to come in the last days, the one who is known in Scripture from the Apostle John as the Antichrist. You know, John was the one who wrote the book of the Revelation. The, the Lord came to John when he was on the island of Patmos, and he wrote this in about 95 AD. But before he wrote the book of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Some years before that, he wrote the epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And in the book of 1 John, it's the first time we come into contact with this word, Antichrist. And John writes this, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. He said, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have arisen from this we know it is the last hour. The Antichrist is coming. John says there have been lots of Antichrists, little Antichrists. An Antichrist is someone who is against Christ. Antichristos is the Greek. It means against Christ. And there have been many throughout the centuries who have been figures in history who have been against Christ. We know that in, in somewhat recent history, World War II, Adolf Hitler was against Christ, Mussolini against Christ, Stalin against Christ, people like Jim Jones and David Koresh against Christ. And John said there is a spirit of Antichrist that's been working in this world for centuries, 
And, and that is the spirit from the devil that is against the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there's a person who is coming. He has not yet come. And he is the Antichrist. He is the devil's big boy, the devil's man. And he is one day going to come on the scene. And he is going to be against Christ. He's Antichrist. But the word Antichrist can also mean instead of Christ. And he's going to be both against Christ and present himself instead of Christ as the world's Messiah and King. Hey, the Bible has much to say about this one who is coming. The Bible calls him a beast, the beast of the sea. The Bible calls him in the book of Daniel, the little horn. The Bible calls him the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. Many different names for him the son of destruction, the king of fierce countenance. And in the book of Daniel, in the book of 2 Thessalonians, and in the book of the Revelation, we learn about this one who is coming in the last days. And so we want to find out about him today, and we want to make some discoveries about him today because he's a key figure in The last days, he's a key figure in the future, and you talk about a shock. He is going to be a major shock to this world. So what does the Bible tell us about the coming of Antichrist? Three discoveries. Discovery number one, he is revealed after the rapture. When will we know who the Antichrist is? We meaning the world. When will the world know who the Antichrist is. Well, he won't even be revealed until after the rapture, until after God takes his church home to be with him in glory. Now, not everybody believes that, and people have differences of opinion when it comes to eschatology, the study of end times, but I believe that the Antichrist is only revealed after the Lord comes in the clouds as we studied in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he comes back in the clouds with the trumpet uh, at the last trumpet of God and he calls us home and and as the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet we're going to rise and the dead rise first and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and thus we shall be always with the Lord. That day is coming, and we don't know when it's going to come, but the Antichrist is revealed after that event. Look what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In this passage, he's talking about the Antichrist, and he says this, you know what restrains him now so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then that lawless one will be revealed. The Bible talks about a restrainer, something that is restraining the revealing of Antichrist. Now, who is strong enough to hold back the devil's man? Is it some system? Is it some law? Is it some person? The only one that can hold back the devil's man, the only one that can defeat the devil is the Lord himself. And so the restrainer is, I believe, is the Holy Spirit of God and the Spirit empowered, the born-again church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that presence is holding back the revealing of the Antichrist. But the Lord said he's coming to get us. And so when he comes to get us, that restrainer is going to be taken up and taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Now you think about this. When the rapture hits and millions of people are gone just like that, the world will be in chaos and in turmoil. And that sets the perfect stage for this man of sin to take over. He's revealed after the rapture, and he comes from the stormy sea of Gentiles. Revelation chapter 13. John says this. He had talked in chapter 12 about the dragon, the dragon who is the serpent of old and the devil. This dragon, he says, and he, the dragon, stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast 
coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. John sees this guy come out of the sea. The dragon is there on the seashore, the dragon who is the devil, and all of a sudden this man comes out of the sea and John sees him. He calls them the beast of the sea. Now the sea, people have said, well, what does that mean, this beast coming up out of the sea? The sea is a picture of the tumultuous sea of humanity. And it says in Revelation chapter 17, in verse 15, John, the waters which you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And so out of peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues comes this man. What does that tell us? It tells, it tells you, it tells me, this guy's gonna be a Gentile. He's not gonna be a Jew. And he has seven heads and 10 horns. If you have your Bible, and it would really help to follow along in your Bible for this message, if you look at Revelation chapter 12, and verse three, and it says, and another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns. So the beast from the sea has seven heads and 10 horns. The dragon, who is the serpent of old, who is the devil, it makes that very, very clear in Revelation 12, nine, he has seven heads and 10 horns. This beast from the sea is a Gentile leader He's going to have power. The, the ten horns speak of power. The seven heads speak of uh, dominion. And he's going to have power and he's going to have dominion. And he is just like the devil. He has seven heads and ten horns. The devil has seven heads and ten horns. This guy's a chip off the old block. And so he is come from the stormy sea of the Gentiles. And he comes with incredible ability. Now, when the Bible talks about, you know, you read this stuff in Revelation, and one of the things about Revelation that can be so hard, there's so much symbolism in Revelation. And so people are like, hey, you know, I'm reading about this stuff, and it's talking about lions and bears and tigers. Uh, it doesn't say anything about tigers. It's, it's leopards, lions and leopards and tigers. And it's just like, good night. I don't, what is that? What kind of a person looks like a, a leopard and looks like a bear and looks like a lion? Well, when the Bible describes the beast from the sea, the Antichrist, this man of sin, it's not how he looks. Those, those uh, animals were used in the book of Daniel. Daniel has much to say about the end times. Daniel has much to say about the Antichrist. And he uses those, uh, those animals to uh, be symbols of nations. The leopard is the symbol of Greece. And how Alexander the Great, the, great, the, the king of Greece, he just uh, took over in uh, the era of the Grecian Empire. And then you have the bear. The bear is a symbol of Medo-Persia, which was a strong kingdom under Cyrus the Great. And then you have the lion. The lion was a picture of Babylon. Now, when Daniel talked about it, he talked about the lion, then the bear, and then the leopard. Because he's talking about, well, it was Babylon, and now, now it's coming Medo-Persia, and then it's going to come Greece. When John talks about it, he looks, he looks backward, and he said, well, who was the first big kingdom? Well, it was Greece, and then it was Medo-Persia, and then it was Babylon, you know, even before that. And so he's saying that this one is going to be like all those kingdoms rolled up into one. He's going to be like all those great kings rolled up into one. He is going to have incredible ability. It says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23 and 24, when the end is near for those kingdoms, there will be a very bold and cruel king who will be very tricky. This king will be very powerful, but his power does not come from himself. Very bold, very tricky, very beast-like. You know what it means to be like a beast? It means you have zero compassion. You know, if you're walking through the, the forest and you come across a bear, you can't plead with the bear, right? Oh, please, bear, don't eat me. Oh, okay, well, I just, I didn't know. You have kids. I mean, he doesn't think about it like that, right? 
He just, he's just gonna instinctively eat you. And no matter how much you break, beg for mercy from a lion or a bear or a leopard, there's no mercy there. There's just destruction. There is total stone cold cruelness from a beast. And that is the Antichrist. He is going to be beast-like in his character, not in his appearance. He's gonna probably be very, very handsome, very, very winsome, he is going to have incredible ability when it comes to politics. He's going to be a political genius. He'll be an economic genius. He'll be a military genius. He'll be an orator like the world has never seen. He speaks. The scripture talks over and over in Revelation and in Daniel about how he speaks these great boasts. And he's a blasphemer, but he has the, uh, the gift of gab. And he can get people to just hang on his every word. If you've ever watched old clips of Adolf Hitler when he would talk to the Germans and he'd have them all gathered there, they would just be uh, hanging on his every word. He was a very eloquent speaker. The Antichrist is going to be like that in spades. It's going to be very, very uh, incredible uh, man of ability. And it says that his power does not come from himself. Well, how, does this, how is this guy such an incredible military genius? How is he such an incredible economic genius? How is he such an incredible leader? How is he such an incredible speaker? Because he is Satan in the flesh. That's how. That's how. He comes with an incredible ability because his power does not come from himself. Revelation 13, verse 2 and the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. That's how he's able to do what he does. The dragon is filling this guy. The dragon is leading this guy. The dragon is empowering this guy. And as Jesus was God in the flesh, the Antichrist will be Satan in the flesh. And he comes at a time when the rapture hits and there is chaos and people are looking to see what are we going to do? How are we going to handle all these problems? You know, there have to be problems in order for people to follow after a leader. If everything is going great and everybody's got a bunch of money in the bank and, and uh, you know, everything is just coming up, uh, you know, roses, nobody is looking to say, help me, help me. But when times are tough and everything is in chaos, then everybody's clamoring, we need help, we need help, we need a leader. Paul Henry Spake was the Secretary General of the United Nations from 1957 to 1961. He was the former premier of Belgium. He said this in a general session of the United Nations in 1957. He said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift, up, lift, lift us out of the economic morass in which we are sinking. Send us such a man and be he God or the devil, we will receive him. So he said in 1957, hey, we don't care if he's God or the devil, we just want someone who has answers. And the Antichrist is gonna come and he's going to have answers. Now, people ask the question, is the Antichrist alive on planet Earth today? The answer is yes. Is the Antichrist, was he alive on planet Earth 100 years ago? The answer is yes. Was he alive on planet Earth 200 years ago? The answer is yes. You say, well, how, how can he, I mean, how old is this guy? How does this, how does this work? Well, remember this. The rapture comes first, and then the Antichrist is revealed. Well, who knows when the rapture is coming? Nobody knows. Jesus said, of that day and of that hour, the angels in heaven don't know, he said, the son doesn't even know. Only the father alone knows that. So if the angels in heaven don't know, and the son, Jesus said of himself when he was on the earth, he didn't know. Rest assured, the devil doesn't know. 
And the Bible teaches us in every generation we are to be ready because we don't know when the Lord is coming. So it's all the time you just be ready, be ready, be ready. Because when the Lord comes, there's no time to get ready. You have to be ready because he comes in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And so we're supposed to live in a, in a state of readiness. Well, so here's the thing. The devil always, through every generation, he has always had someone waiting in the wings to be the man of sin. Because he doesn't, he, he's just gonna do, fill this guy and take over this guy's body and do what he wants. And that guy's just going to be a host, a willing participant, but he's just going to be a host for the devil. So at any time, the devil always has somebody waiting in the wings that he can empower that guy and that guy can rise up. And he can rise up out of obscurity. You know, people have said, concerning different ones, they say, you know, uh, well, do you think this person's the Antichrist? Do you think that person's the Antichrist? You know, somebody said one time that they thought Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. And you know why they thought he was the Antichrist? Because his name is Ronald Wilson Reagan, and he has six letters in each of his names, 666, Ronald Wilson Reagan, Antichrist, I'm done. That's what they thought. We don't know who the Antichrist is. You won't know who the Antichrist is because the Antichrist is revealed after the rapture. So he comes after the rapture. Second discovery, he will rule the whole world. He has seven heads and 10 horns, which speaks of his power and his dominion. The Antichrist is, as I told you, Many Bible scholars believe he's going to be uh, a Gentile and he's going to rise up out of the old Roman Empire and the old Roman Empire is going to be revived with 10 kings and 10 nations that make up this Roman Empire and he's going to lead that. And people say, well, well, how does he obtain uh, all this clout in terms of his uh, worldwide reign? Well, the way he does it is he amazes the people. And what does he do to amaze the people? The scripture says this in verse three. He says, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed. Something happens to this guy during his reign. You know, he, the very first seal, when the book of the Revelation uh, begins with the uh, wrath of God coming, the church has been raptured. Revelation chapter four, verse one. The, I, I heard a voice saying to me, like the sound of a trumpet, come up here. And John was immediately caught up into heaven. A picture of the rapture, a sound of a trumpet. And then John, uh, the Lord shows John what's going to happen in heaven. And then Revelation chapter 6 begins the tribulation period. And the very first thing the Lord does is he opens up the scroll. And it's sealed with wax. And he pops those seals. And every seal is a different kind of judgment that comes upon the earth. And the very first seal that he opens on that scroll is the Antichrist who comes to power. The one who comes on a white horse with a bow yet no arrows. And he comes conquering and to conquer. That's the Antichrist. And something happens to this guy as he's building up his machinery to take over he gets shot or he gets attacked or in some way it looks as if he got killed. But then he comes to life. But he, he, John says, it was, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed. They marvel, they wow. How does that happen? How does this guy, we saw him on uh, Fox News, we saw him on CNN, he was killed, he was shot in the head like Kennedy, and there's no way anybody can survive, and the next day he is out campaigning, he is out uh, speaking. They say, wow, who can do that? He must be Superman. Something's gonna happen that causes the whole world to say, wow. So the people will be amazed by him and the people will be deceived by him. It says in the book of Daniel concerning him, this king will be very smart and tricky. 
He will use his wisdom and lies to be successful. He will think that he is very important. That's Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. He, he has, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, he comes with all false signs and lying wonders. You know, the devil can work miracles. We have a, a, a generation today that seeks after signs and seeks after miracles. Jesus said an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after signs. And boy, we have people that flock to the healing services and they say, oh, look at this. And this must be of God because if there's a miracle, it has to be of God. Watch out. If you start buying into that, because the devil can work miracles, and he's going to come with all false signs and lying wonders, and people are going to see some of the things that he does, and they say, wow, well, who can do a miracle like that? He must be God, and he has help. He has another beast that's talked about in Revelation chapter 13. He's the beast from the earth. We know him as the false prophet. Look in verse 11. John says, and I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. He deceives. He's the false prophet. And here you have the picture. You have the dragon who is standing on the seashore in Revelation 13:1. You have the beast coming up from the sea who is the Antichrist. And then you have this beast from the earth, possibly a Jew, I don't know, but he doesn't come from the sea. He comes from the earth. So some people say he's coming. That's a symbol of the promised land. But this guy comes up, and he's the false prophet. He's the cheerleader for the beast. He is like the anti-Holy Spirit. The beast from the sea, the antichrist, is against Christ instead of Christ. And the beast from the earth is the anti-Holy Spirit. And the dragon is the anti-father. You have an unholy trinity there. And see, the devil is a copycat. And so his fatal wound was healed. What is he trying to copy? He's trying to copy the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus rose from the dead, everybody was like, well, of course, anybody that can rise from the dead, you have to be God. And so the devil twists it and copies it and deceives people saying, uh, well, see, see, my man was slain. But it doesn't say he was slain. He says, as if he were slain. And now he has come back. And so there is this deception going on and the false prophet is the sinister minister of evil. He deceives the people, and he has the ability to perform miracles, and everybody gets duped. So the people will be deceived by him, and the people will follow him. They'll follow him. Look at verse 3. And it says, And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. 42 months is three and a half years. The tribulation period is seven years. The great tribulation is the last half, the last three and a half years or 42 months. It says in verse six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Everybody's going to follow him. He's going to have authority over everyone. He'll rule the whole world. Discovery number three, he will declare himself to be God. Now, here's something very, very interesting. When the, this man of sin comes up out of the sea, out of the stormy sea of humanity, and he comes up with all the answers, and everybody says, man, that guy knows what to do politically, militarily, economically. He's got all the answers. Let's follow him. And man, hey, look at him. He conquered death, and we're going after him. Well, what the, the man of sin, this beast, what he does right off the bat is he makes a treaty, 
a covenant with Israel. He brings peace to the Middle East. And it says that he makes a covenant with the land. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of that seven-year period, the one week is not seven days, it's seven years. So he makes a seven-year treaty with Israel. And he says, you guys can worship your God. And you know what Israel does? They build a temple again. And they begin sacrifices again and grain offerings again. And man, everything's going great. But then it says in the middle of the week, at the three and a half year mark, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is pour it out on the one who makes desolate. You remember when Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation? What is the abomination of desolation? It's when the abominable one, this man of sin, goes into the temple and shuts down everything that they're doing in the temple and he takes his seat in the temple of God and he says, I am God. No longer worship anyone but me. He shows his true colors. And he demands that the world worship him. And he will force people to worship him. Now it says in Revelation chapter 16, or in Revelation chapter, uh, 14, or chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, it talks about the false prophet, this beast from the earth, this, this one that's, he's a religious figure, the false prophet. The Antichrist is not a religious figure. He is probably atheistic. The scripture says in Daniel chapter 11, he has no regard for the gods of his fathers or any god other than himself. And so he doesn't worship any god, he just worships himself. And the false prophet is the one who's involved in religion, and he tells everybody, hey, the beast, he is God, worship him. And he makes this image, an image of the beast. We don't know what it is, some kind of statue. Uh, you know, in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar made this image and he wanted everybody to bow down and worship the image. Well, in the book of the Revelation, chapter 13, the false prophet makes an image, but this, this image can speak. This image is something that gets everybody like, whoa, look at this thing. And the image begins to speak and the image begins to move and it's kind of like big text at the fair. All of a sudden this thing is talking and this thing is moving. It doesn't have life, but it has breath and it's able to speak and it blows everybody away. And he says, you have to worship the beast and you have to worship his image. And if you don't, it's curtains for you. And it says in verse 16, and he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him who understand, who, who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number is that of a man and his number is 666. He gives everybody a mark. Hey, the beast is gonna make you worship him. And one of the things that he's going to do to force you to worship him is he's gonna force you to get a mark either on your right hand or on your forehead. I was thinking, well, why the, the difference? Maybe you get a choice. Or maybe if you don't have a hand, a right hand, it only goes on your forehead. But the word that's used for mark literally means a tattoo, a tattoo. You know anybody that has any tattoos? I mean, you, you think it's gonna be hard to get people to get a tattoo? Well, I wouldn't wanna get a tattoo on my hand or on my forehead. People get them all the time. And in this, this mark, it's gonna be more than just a tattoo because it, it's going to be able to track you. But here's the thing about the mark of the beast. Without the mark, you can't buy or you can't sell. Whether it's a billion dollar business deal or a box of raisin bran, no seal, no sale. You can't do it. You have to have the mark of the beast. And so if in the tribulation period, let's say you're here and you miss the rapture, and you say, man, I, I got left behind. What do I do now? Well, you're gonna go through the tribulation. 
And you're going to, you know what? You're going to know who the Antichrist is. You don't want to because that means you are left behind. But you're going to know. And all of a sudden, you're going to say, man, this is horrible that what's going on in the world. And then when Antichrist shows his true colors and says, everybody worship me and everybody sign up to get the mark. And if you don't, I will kill you. Well, here's the, your dilemma. If you don't get the mark, how can you live? Because you can't buy, you can't sell without the mark of the beast. And if you do get the mark of the beast, the Bible is very clear in Revelation chapter 14. All those who get the mark of the beast, they sell their soul to the devil. They're done. They are going to experience the wrath of God in hell. That you can't get the mark and go to heaven. So people are going to be in a major dilemma. I was talking to my friend Ed Heinsen yesterday. I was talking through some of this stuff. You know, Ed is a professor at Liberty University, he has the television program, The King is Coming. He's forgotten more things than I'll ever know. And so I enjoyed getting to talk to Ed. And I said, Ed, what do you think in terms of people getting saved during the tribulation? He said, the bulk of people getting saved during the tribulation, they'll get saved in the first three and a half years. Because in the second three and a half years, it's going to be too hard. It's going to be too hard. The devil is murdering people by the millions, by the hundreds of millions. Hey, listen, when this guy shows his true colors, he's going to make Adolf Hitler look like a boy scout. He is going to wipe out people. The time is so bad in the Great Tribulation that Jesus said, unless those days had been cut short, everybody would be dead. Everybody would be dead. And you have the devil coming if you're living in the tribulation period. The devil is coming after you. The Antichrist is coming after you, empowered by the devil. And God is raining down judgment upon your head. It's a horrible, awful, terrible situation. And listen, you listen to this and you say, good night. I don't want to come anywhere near that. Is there an escape hatch? Is there some, some way to get away from this? There is. At the cross, my debt was paid. He shed his blood to wash away all my sins. Jesus is the one who delivers from the wrath to come. And many people who come to church, who come to this church, I don't know, but God knows, but I know just based on statistics, many people, they come to church and they have salvation in their head but they don't have it real in their heart, and they're not ready. And if the rapture came today, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they'd be left behind. Perhaps that's you. Perhaps I'm talking about you. You'd be left behind, and you would face all this that I'm talking about. Stories told about the devil having a meeting, a convocation with some of his uh, demonic horde and they're talking about ways to send people to hell and to keep people from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and they're trying to scheme and plan. And one demon said, I know what we'll do. We'll tell them there is no God. And the devil thought for a moment. He said, that'll get some of them, but that won't get the, mo the, the bulk of them. Most people know there's a God. They thought a little more, and one of them stood up and said, I know what we'll do. We'll tell them that there is no hell. The devil said, no, that's probably not going to work either because most people understand that there is, for every uh, kick, there's a kickback, that there is, uh, you know, consequences for things. And somebody says, well, I, I know what we'll do. We'll tell them the Bible's not true. The devil said, no, I don't think that'll work. And then one demon came forward. He said, I know what we'll do. We'll tell them there is a God and that Jesus is his son and the Bible is true and there is a heaven and there is a hell and everything in the scripture is true and they have plenty of time to make a decision for Christ so they can just wait until later. And the devil clapped his hands and says, that's it. That's what we'll do. And that's what he's been doing. And some of you are here and you say, well, you know, I have plenty of time. 
to make a decision because right now, you know, I'm getting ready to go off to college. I'm going to sow my wild oats. I don't want to, I don't want to be saddled down with a relationship with the Lord because I want to go have fun. I want to live it up. And when I get older, that's when I'll turn my life over to the Lord, but not now. And I always have, uh, you know, time later to make that decision. You know what the scripture says? Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Today, the scripture says, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And I don't know who you are, but God knows who you are. And my heart breaks for you who aren't ready. And I want you, as we close out this message, I want you to be ready. Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you in agony and blood. He rose again from the dead. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you have a choice. You can choose Jesus, the Lamb of God, who wants to take away your sin. Or you can face the beast who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you forever in hell. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. The Bible clearly tells us what the world's going to be like when the Lord returns. And you know, that world that the Bible describes, it's upon us right now. So here's the big question. Are you ready for the return of Christ? I mean, if he came back right now, are you ready? So many people are not ready. They're not 100% sure. But you can get sure today. You can pray this simple prayer with me and mean it from your heart and the Lord will come in and change your life forever. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I believe that you love me. So I ask you to come into my life Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know what's going on in your life, to know how we can pray for you, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.